Todd mean? If you look, let's see. So it says, Cantado um, uh, Señor. Sing to the Lord. You can see it. It's right here. So when it says this, it's the next verse is in English. So if you sing it in Spanish, then we sing the same thing in English right after that. So that way you can do it in two languages and that's how you learn it. It's pretty good, huh? Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that um, because I haven't told you anything about corny recently that I'm going to tell you something about corny this morning. And uh, that's correct. Because um, Corny has a new job, and so well, I didn't say anything about it last week or the week. I don't think I said anything about what Corny was doing. What's his job? Well, let me start backward and tell you a little bit more. Um, they, on Corny Street, they've been having a problem with coyotes. Not That's close. <laughs> Coyotes have been coming onto the street and some of the cats on the street have disappeared. And so the neighbors are all concerned about the number of coyotes that have been coming and how they've been harassing the cats. Well, what do you think? They may be consuming, teasing, bothering, <laughs> all those things. So that, so they've been coming, and so the neighbors all got together, and they decided that what they needed to do was form a coyote patrol. And no, they decided that they would appoint some of the dogs on the street to be the coyote patrol. And they chose three of the dogs, one of them is Arnie. Arnie is a, he's a rescued greyhound. You know what greyhound racing dogs? Well, he was rescued from, uh, you know, youth, you know, anyway, he was rescued after he got done being a greyhound racer. And he lives on the street, and so does um, another dog named Jacob, who is a retired police dog. And he is a, um, German Shepherd, and then they thought, the neighbors when they had their meeting, they thought, okay, we, we could get Arnie, and we could get Jacob, and we could get Corny, because they knew Corny is a hero, you know, Corny's a, a, a hound dog, but he's also a hero, and so they said, those guys will be our patrol, and um, which the dogs uh, accepted the responsibility and they gave them, each of the dogs got a blue collar, which gave them permission to walk around on the street any time without a leash. And so the dogs got together and they patrolled up and down the street and around the backs and, and, um, and go into people's backyards looking for coyotes. Now you know that Corny has been successful in chasing away coyotes in the past, right? Well, he's also, you know, from past stories that Corny likes to chase cats. He likes to chase rabbits and he likes to chase cats. So this is a completely new assignment for Corny to be able to protect the cats. Because Corny is used to chasing the cats. And he's had to go through an adjustment with this. But um, all I can say is that when you are given a mission, it changes the way that you look at things. It changes the way that you approach things. When you're given responsibility to do something, you, you, you can be changed. And that's exactly what has happened with um, Corny. He is no longer a cat chaser, but he is now only a coyote chaser. And there are no dramatic stories about what he's done yet, but I can tell you that um, they did manage to chase away coyotes three times in the past week. 
no cats have been harmed, <laughs> and none of the coyotes were harmed either, and none of the dogs were harmed, and they are having harmony on the street. <laughs> And so that's what's happening on Corey Street. That's Corny's new job. He is now on Coyote Patrol. And this very morning, he is out there with his blue collar on and with his two buddies. And they are protecting cats. It's hard to believe it. They are protecting cats. Well, that's, that's the update on Corey. And you've been good listeners. And you know, maybe think about this, though, is before you go that maybe God gives you a responsibility and somehow that responsibility is going to change your life. So, you can go to Sunday school. Thank you. Let's pray. For your word, we live. And because of your word, we are alive. And we thank you for the vibrancy, the vitality, the life that is ours through Christ and, the, and His Word. And so as we look at the written portion of it this morning again, we ask that you would speak to us and encourage us that we might become um, solid followers of Jesus. We, we want to be better. We want to be, we want to be great disciples. And we ask that you would work in our hearts and our minds and our wills that that would, that would happen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're looking this morning at Psalm 9, 1 through 19. How about Acts? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, let's try Acts 9, 1 through 19. And if I space out any other times, anybody is welcome to correct me. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. He found persons who belonged to the way, if he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, those letters, or these letters, would authorize them to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. Those traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but saw no one. After they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and neither ate nor drank anything. In Damascus there was a certain disciple named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, he answered, Yes, Lord. The Lord instructed him, Go to Judas' house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say that he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with authority from the chief priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name. The Lord replied, Go. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And Ananias went to the house. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here. He sent me so that you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, flakes fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After eating, he regained his strength. 
Uh, last Sunday, we learned that uh, pigs really do fly. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about the English expression or, or idiom for what is seemingly impossible or what is the least likely thing to happen when it actually happens. Uh, apparently, at times, God takes some kind of great delight in, in making pigs fly. And last Sunday, we read about the uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, about how he was not a really good candidate for uh, uh, entry or to be welcomed into the community of Jesus. He was culturally distant. He was a eunuch which would automatically have excluded him from full participation in the Jewish community. And at that point in time, the church was a part of the Jewish community. He, he was an unlikely convert, but he begged for baptism. Look, here's some water. Is there any reason why I should not be baptized? And Philip, led to the moment by an angel and the Holy Spirit, baptizes him. Clearly, this is something totally new. This is a change in policy, or perhaps it's a total change in outlook and in how people are perceived and how people are going to be welcomed. So to a first century reader, it was a flying pig moment. But how much more so uh, this morning as we look in the events which transpired on the road to Damascus, and yes, nope, it, it's on a road, like, like last week, this event takes place on the road, and it takes place in an isolated area. It's out of the city center. It, it, it's out there in the sticks where, where flying pigs graze. <laughs> God has great news, and he wants to spread it in a great and usual way. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And sometimes, God calls underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. And, and by the way, for, for English learners, these are our two power words for the day. Underwhelming is the first one. That means not very impressive. Something that is underwhelming means I'm not impressed with it. And then overwhelming is a problem or a situation that is so big that you feel like you can't handle it. It's overwhelming to me. It's just too much. And the key point this morning is that God calls underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. Are, are, are you an underwhelming person? The, 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 the call of, of Saul is a prime example of this. Think about it for a minute. If you were God, and you wanted to tell everyone in the entire world that you love them so much that you sent your only son into the world to die and to conquer death, establishing total forgiveness, establishing a new relationship with him through Jesus who is Lord. Uh, if you had that kind of assignment to dish out, to give out to somebody, would you choose to call the man who was the most vocal in his opposition to you to carry out that job? Would you have chosen the man who had given his life to hunting down and jailing those who were your best followers? Would you choose the man who acted as the official witness to the stoning of your most articulate preacher? Would you choose a Pharisee? The, the very group of people that Jesus most often spoke out against? Would you choose a man who despised the very non-Jewish people to whom you were going to send him? Would you choose a man who did not even know you? Look, look again at the text in verse 1. 
Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If, you, if he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them to prisons, in, to, as prisoners to Jerusalem. And during the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice calling, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? And what's his response? Verse 5. Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Master? Who, well, I mean, I don't know you. You are an unknown to me. Folks, if I were in charge of the Jesus expansion campaign, I would look for someone who who at the bare minimum was a Christian. Right? I mean, is that... And I look for someone with at least a little bit of experience in the organization. They head up this major new division. Uh, perhaps somebody with a little bit of maturity and experience under his belt. Someone who was a proven disciple himself. Someone with good organizational skills. Someone with fundraising capabilities and a positive public demeanor. You know, public presence is important. You know? and, and yes, someone who did not put people to sleep when he preached. <laughs> which Paul was probably doing. And, and, and if I were making decisions, Verse 13, Ananias countered, Lord, I, I've heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your people. He's here with authority from the chief priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. And the Lord replied, Go. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. God has this, has this thing about calling underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. After the resurrection, Jesus called Peter to care for his sheep and become a shepherd for the Lord to take responsibility for, for leading the church, right? Peter, if you really love me, you'll pick up where, where I've left off. And, and you can almost hear James and you can almost hear John muttering behind, they're standing behind Peter, and they're waving their hands like, not Peter. <laughs> Lord, not Peter, don't put him in charge. Remember, he is the guy who impulsively started slashing with that sword. And, and, and he's the one who denied you not once, not twice, but three times, three times on that night. Lord, Peter's a great guy, but he's unreliable. And not, not only that, he's unpredictable. Call on someone else if you want to get the job done right. But God seems intent on calling these underwhelming people for these overwhelming assignments. Or consider Ananias. He, he, he's in our story this morning. The man to whom the Lord sends Saul after the Damascus Road experience. While, while he is certainly a, a faithful man, he, he is pretty much, as best we can tell, a nobody. He's an ordinary Christian. Uh, he, he's living in Damascus, which is not exactly the center of the universe. And he is not a part of the apostolic elite crew. He is not one of the 12 disciples. He doesn't even appear to be one of the next ring out. In all things considered, Ananias is kind of an underwhelming character. God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for these overwhelming assignments. Consider the case as well of Patrick. Patrick was born in the late 4th century in England. At the age of 16, I told the story before, he, he and many others from his village were kidnapped apparently by some vengeful exiled sons of a king of the Britons, and Patrick's father was killed, his sister disappeared, and he was sold into slavery in Ireland, where he was made a shepherd. 
And there are all kinds of legends regarding his escape. However, what, what seems pretty clear and evident is that he managed to get back to England after six years of slavery. And then one night he had a dream. And, and in the dream, God was calling him to return to pagan Ireland to preach the gospel there. The ex shepherd slave who became St. Patrick. Uh, you know, is, is thinking at this time, you've got, he's got crazy thoughts bouncing between his ears at that point. God, you've got to be kidding. If you want to make me into a saint of some sort, why would you want to do it in Ireland? I'm not the right guy for that kind of a place. I, I mean, I've already done Ireland. And it wasn't such a marvelous tour. I, I, I can't go back there. I, I'm a former slave. You know, can you imagine what they would do to a former state of slave? Lord, you need to get someone better suited, someone trained in missiology. You need to get someone who actually likes shamrocks. <laughs> but Patrick went anyway. God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. Or consider Agnes Garnoxia Boxiu. She's an Albanian. She was born in 1910 in uh, Skopje, Macedonia, uh, surrounded by Muslims in a Muslim community. And, and totally unexpected, when Agnes was nine, her father died. Her mother raised Agnes and her two sisters, eking out a living by sewing. And, and you wonder if they had had um, a better situation, if they had had more access to nutrition at that point in time if, if these girls would have grown up to be tall. They were all, they're short. I mean, they were usually short. To say the least, Agnes was slight of stature and slight of status from a poor family in a backwater place. And yet God spoke to her, sent her to a completely foreign place, India, and, and had her start a a Catholic religious order called the Sisters of Charity, which was there to care for the poorest of the poor. And, and when Mother Teresa died in 1997, they all but closed down the entire country of India for her funeral. God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for these overwhelming assignments. Sometimes I have to remind myself of this because I mean, I work with interesting people. People, you know, get bored when I speak sometimes, not just because I'm, I'm an ordinary speaker, I'm fine, but, but the, some can't focus. The, they are not motivated to try and track with what I'm saying. They fall asleep during my sermons or, or during my classes. A, a college student, who, I, I'm thinking of a college student who's managed to mess things up and is partying to the point where he can't make passing grades. And I think, this guy's a loser. <laughs> there, there's no hope this guy's not going to amount to much at all, uh, at, at least not in terms of what God is doing. There, there's nothing of significance that's going to come out of this person's life. They are so underwhelming, spiritually speaking. But then 20 years later, they end up as the church chairman. They end up as extremely effective youth leaders. They end up as great, generous givers. They, they, they end up leading people to Christ. And, 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 and sometimes I look at myself in the same light as these losers. God, I, I, I'm such a spiritual lightweight. You don't really want me to be a pastor. You, you don't want me doing a new church. Lord, I can think of dozens of people better suited for this kind of thing than me. People, people who pray two hours a day. People who never miss their daily devotions. And, and people who are always leading people to Christ. You know, no matter where they go, it's just like, oh, they're, oh, they're just come. But for some reason, God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. Why is that? Why does God choose the most obnoxious, mean-spirited, self-righteous, religiously arrogant, super-kosher Jew and strike him down with a blinding light beam so he can tell him that he's been chosen to bring the good news of Jesus to Jews 
Gentiles and rulers. Well, weren't there not already 12 well-trained, credentialed disciples, apostles, graduated from Jesus' own college of the Bible, who could have headed up this new operation, moving the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, where it was producing incredible fruit. Things were going pretty well, and, and they were moving on rapidly toward the ends of the earth. There were certainly other people, more qualified people. Um, there, there were certainly uh, other better equipped Christians, but for some reason or another, God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for his overwhelming disciples. Saul, who also became known as Paul, um, St. Paul made an interesting comment in 2 Corinthians 12. And, and he's actually at that point referring to a physical weakness that was slowing him down. But, but I think it's really relevant to what he said here in Acts 9. He said, I, I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, verse 10, therefore I'm, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Then he goes on in the next chapter, chapter 13, to say, since you are demanding proof that Christ speaks through me, Christ isn't weak in dealing with you, but shows his power among you. Certainly he was crucified because of weakness, but he lives by the power of God. Certainly we also are weak in him, but we will live together with him because of God's power that is directed toward him. Saul, or using his Greek name, Paul, is saying, my inadequacies, my weaknesses, force me to rely on the power and the grace of God. That is, I, I, I'm not going to be as likely to trip over my pride, for I'm such a loser that I don't have any pride left to trip over. If, if something is going to happen, God is going to have to make it happen. He's going to have to bring the people, and He's going to have to bring the circumstances together. He's going to have to give me the words to say and, and the grace to know when to say it. He's going to have to do it. And once he's doing it, well, nothing is all that overwhelming. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm the least important of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I harass God's church. I am what I am by God's grace, and God's grace hasn't been for nothing. In fact, I have worked harder than all the others, that is, it wasn't me, but the grace of God that is with me. God seems intent on calling underwhelming people for his overwhelming assignments. So are, are, are you seeing how this fits in with your own life? Perhaps you are wondering if God could ever do anything anything of significance with your life. And, and the very idea of doing something important seems kind of overwhelming, especially since you don't have the most stable marriage, or because your kids seem to be so out of it spiritually, or because you've been a jerk at school, or because you're too old, or you are too young, or because you are struggling financially, you feel inadequate when it comes to doing any of God's business, and, and, you, and, and totally out of it when it comes to anything that could be a possibly of importance. Now, I, I'm not saying that God has a new big assignment in mind for you. He may or may not. But I want to challenge you to be open to the possibilities, to new possibilities, to new flying pig possibilities. To consider that God might be calling you to act in spite of your weakness. 
or even through your weakness. To give from your poverty. To go someplace that you would not ever possibly dream of going on your own. To personally go to the end of the earth with the good news of Jesus. To the unreached afar people in Somalia or the, or the Jats in, in Pakistan. To pour time and energy into a hopeless and, and, and a pathetic neighbor. To jump into some overwhelming social issues or issue that drags people down. Or human trafficking. Immigration policy. The, the inequity and in sentencing of prisoners. Could it be that you are the underwhelming person for an overwhelming assignment? Are you the underwhelming person for an overwhelming assignment?